You're live, Madam Chair. Okay. Welcome, folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions. It is Thursday, February 2nd. We are starting our afternoon uh, committee meeting, and we're going to be spending all afternoon talking um, on issues about Department of Corrections. We're going to get a lot of updates from the commissioner, um, and then we're also going to hear from BSCA as well. So I'm going to start with Commissioner Demo. Welcome back to Vermont. You were away last week. <laughs> So welcome back. And I know that for the committee, we do have some uh, documents that have been submitted to our committee webpage, and then we do have some copy, paper copies here. So welcome, Commissioner. Thank you um, very excuse much. Excuse me for eating my lunch. Not at all. Um, well, again, my name is Nick Demo. I'm the Commissioner of Vermont Department of Corrections. Appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk about this. Uh, this is the single most important thing we are working on in the Department of Corrections. Uh, if we cannot fix, adjust, uh, and build a sustainable workforce for the Department of Corrections, we cannot do any of the policy objectives. We can't advance the policies of the state in corrections. We can't do justice reinvestment. Uh, we can't ensure that people are successfully reentering in our community. So we have to get this piece right if we're gonna be able to do anything else. Um, and I think this has really been an evolution of thought for us in the last, I've been here 14, 15 months, um, especially in the last year. Um, and, and it's interesting, the chair mentioned that I was out of town last week. I was meeting with the other corrections executives from around the country. And <clears throat> this is the single most important topic occurring nationally too. And we're only just getting our heads around the magnitude and the complexity of this problem. And so what I mean by that is I think everybody understands that there aren't enough staff in corrections to do the work that's assigned to them. That's, that's kind of the very basic level of analysis. What I think has been missing from the conversation is that's not, um, that's not necessarily fixable in our current construct. And I'm going to show you some of the data that will underpin what I mean by that. Um, we, we are at the precipice of a very dangerous slope here where um, we want to get more staff into our system. And clearly, we're having difficulty with that, and we have for a few years. And part of that is because we haven't done the right things to bring staff in. A bigger part of that, though, is that the demographics, the available workforces we're pulling from, are evaporating. And so there are fewer people available, even if we're doing everything right, uh, which means we probably can't do corrections the way we have historically. We need to start reinventing the way we do the practice of corrections. And uh, the other thing I would highlight is this is not a Vermont problem. It's a problem Vermont is experiencing. This is a national problem. And I know this because there's ample data from every state in the country that they're having outrageous understaffing issues. Um, I know from talking to my fellow commissioners, directors, executives from around the country, <clears throat> they're having these exact same problems. Um, there needs to be a national conversation about this and a national solution to that. It's part of what we talked about last week um, when we were away. And we did that with the Assistant Attorney General of the United States and with several of her Justice Department directors. Uh, and, and they're starting to recognize the national impact of what's coming, what's here and what's coming. Um, and, and I think Vermont is at the center of that table. You know, there's a couple of states that are really innovating and thinking about this a little differently. This may sound strange, but Texas and Vermont are two of the thought leaders in this space. And it's because we've identified, we've understood through data that this problem is way bigger than we thought it was when we set out. Uh, and, and we need help. We need resources, but I don't necessarily need, mean money. I mean, we need thought leaders at the table sitting down and working through some of this with us. And, and so we're starting a national initiative to address corrections, workforce, uh, staffing crises across the country. We hope that that will be supported by the Department of Justice through some of their assistance, through training, technical assistance, and financial assistance. Um, but, but we can't solve this in a vacuum. 
we can't look at this as a Vermont problem and say Vermont needs to solve it for itself and New York needs to solve it for itself and New Hampshire needs to solve it for itself because it's a much, much bigger problem. Um, so let me show you some of what I mean by that. Did you have a question, Mary? Well, I was going to make a statement, quite honestly. This is very different from when you were here a week or two ago when you were saying you had made steps in the right direction mm -hmm. going. And now you're saying you know, the ethics on what we were working on. So how do you go from one very definite position to another position that's almost the opposite? And in your executive meetings with folks around the country, did you have any of the staff involved in any of those discussions? So I think what I said is not contradictory. What I mean is the problem is much bigger than just one state will solve. We have, I think, pretty innovatively come up with solutions that are not, they're new tools to the problem. And we'll show you some of that in our own data over the last six to eight months. We have, we've started targeting areas of our system that we hadn't in the past, like staff wellness, like career development, professional development, because the one tool we always go to, and Vermont has gone to it a lot, is we just need to pay people more money. Compensation is definitely part of this conversation, but that's the tool we've used over and over again, and other states have used over and over again, and we don't see any real data to suggest that works. What we do see data in, though, is we know who we're recruiting and who we need to retain in our system. And we know through studies of those people, those generations, what things attract them to careers. It's connection to mission. It's work-life balance so they see their families. It's staff wellness issues. And so we've started to really target our staff solutions with those things in mind. And we'll see that when we get into the stability and sustainability plan, because we have made a pretty market change in the last six to eight months. And other states are not necessarily keeping up with that. So because let's, they're not following in, in that same thing. Well, so let's, let's hold off a little bit, because okay. I think there's a technology issue happening here that maybe the document was not on our web page. Is that what's uh, what, happening? What I posted was <laughs> labeled HCI DOC staffing 2.2. And is that not what, what are you seeing on yours? We have seen that. Seen print pilot. Is, is did January you get that now. off from today? That's today. Yeah, it was today. You might need to refresh the website if you've just reposted the new presentation. I'm sorry, we got to figure this out here. Yeah, you do it on your. It's under the commissioners. Yeah, it's, well, refresh, it under, refresh it. Just, our web page. Well, you can refresh your page. Share notes with me, but I don't know how many other ones. Refresh the web page, the committee web page, and then the new document will download. The system, did that work? You'll see system innovation. And then, hmm. I don't know where we went wrong. I think, um, that's it. Well, I'm always that into no. Do we I have another one? I only printed five. Let me open the one that. Is emailed Yeah, I can email it. That would be a list. The website was down. The whole ledger. Ledger IT. This is it. I wrote it. Ledger IT. I wrote it. I've seen the. Oh, that's true. Open pilot. That's a voice level. Yeah. I bet that's January 19th, yeah. If it's doing it, put it to the site. It's not doing it. All right, so I'm just forwarding it to you. By email? By to everyone's email. email. Just a okay. Yep. I just want to get this taken care of before mm -hmm. we get too far. And I'm working up here in school. <laughs> we'll get a chalkboard in here and I'll draw the chart. <laughs> right. Things are wacky. I think we used to function without electronics. Paper copy. That's mine. 
It's a message from Kevin Moore. Yeah, they had a problem. Uh, outage, That's what yeah. Tristan was saying. They had a problem. Yeah, with an outage as of 1145. <laughs> oh, gosh. I know. It's <laughs> That's always amazing. I need a special oh, little folder for him. They're so entertaining. Okay, no, no subject, but it's just coming to you now. Anybody get it? Just came through. There it is. <clears throat> got it? <clears throat> We're good. Okay, Mary. Yep, it's all it. yours. I okay. I just, um, you know, based upon what the uh, survey did at the, the university mm -hmm. did, and what we talked about, and from their view, many of the things that you said we were doing in a positive direction were not happening. So I hope. And right. <clears throat> where things are actually going in a good way, if they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll I think that that's an excellent question, Representative. And I'll highlight that and remind the, the committee that this survey was taken at Southern State in June of uh, 22. So that occurred prior to our implementation of the plan I'm about to outline for you today. And I'll show you some of our initial data. Uh, that we've collected on this and highlight that it's purely initial data. It looks like we're moving in the right direction, but we may not. And, and we'll make the adjustments and we'll own that if that's not the case. Um, if, if I can orient you to the first slide that we have in here, and hopefully everybody has it now. This is data from the Bureau of um, uh, Labor Statistics at the federal level. And this is showing the change in the working uh, eligible population in the United States over uh, from 1970 and then with projections through 2030. The red box is really the box you need to focus on. That's, that's your general working eligible population. Uh, certainly people over 65 can continue to work, but I hope so. Generally, we don't, <laughs> generally we don't see that in the correction space. Uh, remembering that these jobs are very difficult, physically uh, uh, demanding, physically demanding. So I guess to really simplify my, my kind of preface comments, the workforce that's out there is shrinking dramatically with no projection that that will change in the near term. Uh, and so what we did before, things that worked to recruit, retain, if we, if we just recruited and retained as if it were a normal environment, got back to uh, a, a little bit lower vacancy rate, uh, we still will not be competitive enough. And so we need to be a preferred employer for the state. We need to be as competitive as we can be. And so we're gonna target all of our staffing work, recruitment retention, professional development, all of that towards the attributes we know that will make us very competitive and basic at its most basic level, make people want to work for the Department of Corrections because we're competing against every employer with an increasingly small group of folks who are even available to work in the first place. Vince, go way back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we, yeah, we talk about this at the national level because th this this is obviously national data. This is what the national landscape looks like. But there are just going to be fewer and fewer employees available to hire. And we're, we're going to have to get more competitive because we the only way to be able to grab some of that small number is to be the best employer that we can be. And we haven't always done that. I'll be very candid about it. And especially in the, in the recent era, we haven't done as good of a job as we need to be to be a really preferred employer that, that if the employee at a human level feels like the department is invested in them, that we're leading them properly, uh, and, and that we're supporting them in their whole life. So if you go to the next slide, this is Vermont data. So this is Vermont specific. A little different, so, so it's hard to orient yourself, but, but basically the blue lines are areas where the population is growing and the red lines are areas where the population is decreasing. So in most of our uh, hiring range, 20 to say 60, the population is decreasing upwards of 20, 30% in some categories. 
So again, those are the people we're trying to capture to be employees in our system that want to work for us. And that number is increasingly evaporating on us. So I want to give you that to orient you to how then do we go out and recruit? And how do we attract people to DOC? And then most importantly, because we're, we're recruiting is that actually the easy part of this. How do we retain those people and keep them in our system? And, and so there's a couple of key takeaways from this early data that I want you to, want you to, to walk away with. Uh, we're experiencing a national problem. This is not just a Vermont problem. The available workforce that we have is, is shrinking. So the only way that we're going to be super competitive with the people who are left or who are available in the workforce is if we are really innovative and pushing the envelope and changing the way we have done this work from uh, previous years. So, so the way we tackle that is through something we call the stability and sustainability problem uh, uh, plan. There's the real logic behind this is we first needed to just stabilize our facilities. We just needed to stop the bleeding and make sure that we can run the facility safely and securely for our staff, for those in the care and custody, and for the community. We couldn't start thinking about sustainability until we, you know, you're in the middle of crisis. You don't start thinking about what you're going to eat for lunch next week. You deal with the crisis in front of you. And so that's what we did. Uh, but we know that just stopping the bleeding, just stabilizing the system wasn't going to be enough because we're looking at this other data that says this problem is just going to keep getting worse and worse. So we need to design a way to become sustainable for the long term so that Vermont can rely on its correction system to do its mission every day for the rest of our lives and hopefully many of those who come after us. Um, we broke the problem down, as you'll see on the next slide, into these categories. We simply didn't have enough staff to run the facilities. We were in a vicious cycle of burnout, people resigning, uh, disciplinary action, early retirements, and losing many people more than we were bringing in. I think the third one is perhaps the most important. We were not, and we certainly were not showing that we were valuing our staff and investing in them. And, and I don't mean money. I mean, we were not showing them that we were leading them properly, that we were taking care of them, that we cared about them. Uh, we were not acknowledging or, or recognizing the fact that these are extraordinarily difficult jobs uh, and, and deserve extra support and extra investment in the individual. And that resulted in low morale. And the low morale is, is the killer. I mean, that's why people they, they don't want to work there. They don't feel welcome. They don't feel included. They got bad bosses. Those are the reasons that drive people out of the system. And that's what we had in DOC. We also had not invested in a couple of things, but we hadn't invested in any data analysis to understand this problem. We just heard things and thought things that were not backed up by evidence, data. We're not, we, we could not show what we were talking about. Um, and it's, it's a common feature, again, across the country, and it was happening here in Vermont, where it was like, well, we have a staffing problem, so we should do X. Even though there's no thought or study put into, will, will that solution actually impact the problem, or will it not? Um, and so we created a, a data analysis team to really dig into this problem set to understand the problem before we start just throwing solutions at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, the other thing is, we just we say that changing the culture, investing in our staff, uh, attracting more staff was our our most that's the most important thing we do here, and we had no resources dedicated to that. We had a, a couple of recruitment retention specialists. So that was it. There was no uh, department or division within the department focused on the staff experience. There was nobody focusing on recruitment and retention. Our facilities did not have recruiters. Uh, and so we're saying on the one hand, this is the most important thing we're doing. And on the other hand, we've dedicated nothing to that problem set. And that got us to some of the major problems we were having. So that's the problem set as we saw it. So Commissioner, I think we have a yes. question. Yes. So what I'm looking at here 
if we start from the bottom, what you're saying, the problem is at the bottom training, which then second piece would express leadership, which led training to leadership to the results up above. Is that a, that a fair statement? I mean, I think training is part of it. I think of it. Well, let me let me let me add in your recruitment piece. Training, recruitment. Second piece, DOC not successful in showing it value, leadership, which led to shortage, burnout. But yeah. it really starts at the the training piece. I'd like to call it development because I okay, think because we can... we're really good at training. Like you, here's how you're going to use uh, use of force. You have to confront a use of force situation. We're really good at training how to do that. I agree with what that. What we're not good at is saying, I want to set you up for success in your exactly. career. I want to help you to gain new skills so that if you're a CO but you want to be a PO, we can get you there. We, we don't do we did not do that well. So yes, I think you're you're right, but I would call it we don't develop our staff. We don't develop people into leaders, into better staff members, into whatever. Okay. We really don't professionalize right. the positions and honor That's that profession. That's where I was getting to. And honor that profession. We're good at training skills. We're not good at developing people as <clears throat> professionals. That's absolutely right. Well, with development call it comes training. Yeah, I mean, training informed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. But I just don't, because we talk about training a lot, so I just don't want to conflate the two, because I think they're a little bit different. Um, and development doesn't that. have to just be training. It can be, hey, I'm your supervisor. I sit down with you every couple of months, and we just talk about your career. Hey, here's what's going right. Here's some areas you can improve. What do you want out of your career? How do I get you there? How do I help you? Get... That's not training necessarily, but it is developing the employee. And I think we have not valued that as an important aspect of our work, and we need to. I mean, that is critically important, especially when we talk about millennials and Gen Z. That level of hands-on development is critically important to keeping them employees in the state. Great. So we have some more questions. We have Chip, Mary, Tristan. So it seems to me it would be difficult in knowing the corrections system or hierarchy uh, employment. So to offer someone a career um, they need a place to go. So if you've got a hundred officers and four ship supervisors, that limits it right there. That limits upper, upward mobility. So you say, okay, well, you can go and be a PO. You're not locked into your into a facility 12 hours a day. Yep. That is a big improvement, but there are only so many POs in a, in a district. So upward mobility seems to be um, an issue that it's almost insurmountable, I would say, you know, I mean, if you start as a CO1 and you spend five years there um, and there's no openings in a supervisory, a supervisory uh, uh, layer and there are no openings in your probation offices, you're stuck there as a CO1 or maybe get in, becoming a CO2, which means a better pay grade and such. But it, it just it just strikes me that you're starting with limitations that seem really, really difficult. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. The way that is the system as it exists right now. And that is a problem. Yeah. So how do we change it? How do we fix <laughs> it? Right? The next question. Uh, so my thinking on that is that we need to get more diversity of experience in. So not, so maybe you don't move from a CO1 to a supervisor, but you move around as a CO1 and get to do some different things. Maybe we bring in different types of training or education. We, we continue to enhance our special teams, which are kind of duty assignments that are above and beyond the normal. So we, you know, we have a special response team that responds when there's crisis in the facility. We have a peer support team. Um, but, but we find other ways to infuse the diversity of experience into our system to keep people interested. Yeah. Because you're right. I mean, there are only so many positions yeah. and places to go. I think in some ways, we're fortunate in the Department of Corrections, we actually have a lot more places for people to go than many states' departments. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still limited. And then, you know, I think the, the other thing is we do have to grapple with the fact that we just, looking at what motivates the generations that we're hiring, we may not be able to expect they're going to stay for 30 years anymore. That just may not be the reality, even if we, that, that could be our goal, we want to keep you for 30 years, we want to give you an enriching career, you, so you get the benefits the state has put aside, 
but we also are, are going to need to be comfortable enough with, we may have you for three years and let's make the most of that time and give you some new skills. So wherever you go, like good on you. And, and hopefully, you know, we can remain friends and, and you remember the time with DOC fondly, but we got to think about that a little differently. And then I think there's some other ways, you know, we can, add some other positions into the system that may give some more flexibility. You know, we've, we've talked in the past about a CO3 rank, which is more of a, a leadership rank before you get to shift supervisor. Yeah. They could be the FTO, the training officer, things like that. Um, we've talked about adding uh, recruitment and retention officers right into the facilities. And that could be a security rank. And, and their job is really to monitor, support, the retention needs of the facility to keep people, hey, I'm noticing that this shift, like, people are mad. Let's dig in on that, figure out what's going on. Is it a supervisor issue? Is it staff conflict? Is it they don't like the food? Whatever it is, let's figure that out so we can start to, to fix that. Those are some of the things that I think would help address what you're talking about. But you're right, under the current construct, it's... I'm going to be a CO1 today. I'm going to be a CO1 in five years. Hopefully someday I'm not a CO1 because I want to do something else, but, but there's only so many places to go. So we have some more questions here. We have Mary, Tristan, and Connor. Um, you mentioned a couple of different things in your statement. You talked about prices. Mm -hmm. If facilities have been in crisis in regards to your staff, mm -hmm. we were told last year, and I believe the year before, that it was going to be kind of, a, and you weren't there, so I will give you that, you know, as well. But we were given, being told, that all hands would be on deck. Leadership starts from the top. Mm -hmm. You roll up your sleeves, you work right beside your staff, you get the job done, all hands on deck. That has not happened. I respectfully disagree with you on this point. I know we had some of this conversation last time. We cannot do this level of work without leadership in place who, who has the space, the capacity to do that. I mean, the folks at the central office are working long hours as well, and, and they're not working a shift in the unit, and that's not, those jobs aren't equal. I get that. And I but, understand. But we need leaders in place who can sit down and work through this stuff because the solutions are extremely extremely complicated and if we just say get into the facility and work a shift yes that may have a momentary blip on the morale radar but we're losing opportunities to really fix the problems for the long term and i think that's where we have to invest our very finite leadership resources is on the solution building well you said peer support i think we've seen in a lot of the reports they don't feel supported. So you've got to start from the ground up to do that and really get your arms around this. Because I don't think you're going to have anywhere your expertise, whatever plan you have for this year. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not being real. It's not sounding very really positive. Okay. Well, I think we'll show you in the data some of the things that we've done that have moved that needle. I also just, you know, I know that there are, Inherently, there is a divide between the field, the facilities, and the central office. And I think it's obvious that that has gotten bigger. The divide has grown over the last couple of years. Uh, I recognize that, and, and I want to close that gap down. But I think when we target one of our workforces against the other, one part of our facility against the field, does nobody any good. Uh, and so we're one department. And we're working in our assigned duties, and many folks, to include many of the central office, are working well beyond their assigned duties uh, to, to fix these problems. And, and whether that means you work an extra hour in the facility, or whether it means you have a full-time operations manager job, and you're doing a COVID response team job, and you're helping travel around the state to mentor other leaders around the state, that all contributes to the common good. And I think it's all valuable. And I, I really don't want to pit one of our workforces against the other. We have more questions here. They keep popping up. Um, so we got Tristan, Connor, and Jeannie. Gina. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think you, I really thought you were insightful when you mentioned the connection to mission as a key issue. Um, I looked at the, you know, the statute establishing 
DOC and what you do. The mission is fantastic. You know, it speaks of human dignity, speaks of rehabilitation, reintegrating into community. Uh, where that statue looks really flat to my eye is a definition of correctional officer. Uh, mm -hmm. Job classification mm -hmm. includes, quote, the supervision or monitoring of a person on parole, probation, or serving any sentence of incarceration, whether inside or outside a correctional facility. So you have a job description of a, a, a supervisor or monitor, someone's keeping an eye on things. Right. That, that job description in statute doesn't speak to human dignity, which could be a, a higher calling uh, that could infuse this department with a uh, great mission and attract the best human capital that we have. I wonder if you've considered that. Yeah, that's a great thought. I have not considered that, uh, but I think it's something that we would be very interested in. I will say one thing we did over the last year is really sit down and examine and spend literally a year working on this is looking at our mission, vision, and value statements. And I know that feels corporate and I get it, but it does provide a framework for our staff to really understand what are the values of the department? What, what is my mission here? Um, and so we will be launching that hopefully in the next few weeks system-wide. And that could be a great jumping off point to examine some of the statutory language and maybe infuse some of that into statutory language. Because I think the mission, vision, and values work that we, we did really does focus on the human service aspect of this, recognizing the people we're caring for are human beings. And, and I think all, that is a huge driving force for why people join our department. Thank you. Thank you. Connor, then Gina. Yeah, right. Look, Commissioner, I totally agree with you that it's about more than just money, right? It's about dignity, it's about purpose, it's about a, you know opportunity for advancement. At the same time, like, I'm doing a Google search, like a job search up in Burlington, and it's entry level CO1, mm -hmm. 20 bucks an hour. Next line down, Burlington Bagel Company, 25 bucks yeah. an hour, right? <laughs> and it's like, okay, one job I toast bagels, the other ones I like get belly through, it's flown at me, and like, you know, like get a chance of assault. So I don't, like, it always bothers me when people say, like, corrections is unskilled labor. I think it's highly skilled, but I, I just don't know how you overcome that without throwing more money at it. So is, does the administration have something in the budget coming up? Um, I, I think part of that gonna... is our classification system in terms of the pay scale and the steps. So as a CO1, it's a certain pay scale and mm -hmm. qualifications are a high school diploma or GED. <clears throat> That's it. So we've we've reached out to government operations committee last time last term and say hey if you really want to professionalize or bring in and i think tristan brings up a good point i mean you got to look at the statute in terms of how you define a correction officer if you want to bring in folks who want to make a career out of it you're going to have to change the classification of that in terms of yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, I think there's two things that we've done on this front that really matter. Um, and and I, your point is very well taken. And I don't mean to be glib or to say that money doesn't matter. It absolutely does. Um, but we can't look at it in just a vacuum of we need to pay them more. That will solve the problem because it won't. Um, what we've done is as part of our side letter agreement last year, we proposed a market factor analysis. That idea originally came to us from VSEA, and I think it was a great idea uh, to study. We want to start with security staff positions. They're the most critical at the moment that we need to fill, but then expanding it to the whole classification of the department, study that against regional and national correction systems uh, to understand, like, are we where we should be in pay? Do we need, should it be higher? I don't think it'll go the other way, so. <laughs> Are we where we're at? Should it be higher? If so, what are the comparables? Um, so we did that. DHR is working on that. That's a process outside of DOC's control, but it's something we requested of DHR and they accepted, uh, and they're studying that. When we have those results, we'll absolutely publish them to our whole staff, but also for you all. Um, the other thing is the state has made an enormous investment in correction staff in the last two years to the tune of $11 million. Uh, right to the pockets of correction staff. So that came in increased hourly pay enhancements for security staff, 
uh, standby overages, so they're being paid a couple bucks an hour more on, on standby. It also came in multiple retention bonuses, a referral bonus program, uh, a recruitment retention program where you know you enter the academy, you get a bonus, you graduate, you get a little bit. After six months, you get a little bit. Um, and so, you know, we hear often that the state needs to make a major injection of money into the system. I mean, that was $11 million on top of the new contract uh, over the last year. So don't, I don't want you to leave the room thinking money isn't part of our solutioning. It just isn't our only solution. Um, and I think the market factor analysis will help guide us a little bit on that. One other thing, though, that you raise an interesting point, and that's often we, we say, well, this isn't true, but I'm going to say it anyway. New York gets paid more than Vermont, or New Hampshire gets paid more than Vermont. The reality is that's not our competitor. Our competitor is the manufacturing job or the, the bagel, case, bagel people. The bagel people. Um, it, it's we're not competing against other correction systems just because of our geographic configuration. So we need to account for that in our market factor analysis. Thank you, Gina, and then Wayne. I know Pennsylvania's had a lot of success with their corrections program. Is that a model that you've looked at at all, and it focus it speaks to both? prisoner well-being and uh, the well-being of corrections officer, as well as a considerable jump in pay. And they've got something like a 1% um, vacancy rate right now. Is that anything? Yes, yeah, so we, we have a very close relationship uh, with the commissioner from Pennsylvania, and, and he has done <laughs> a really innovative work over the last several years. I mean, they have a prison called Little Scandinavia, <laughs> which is an you know bringing the kind of Norway model of corrections See, into go down there. Yeah, Norway. Uh, Al Comir and I have volunteered to go to Norway <laughs> to research this. I just I, I let the cherry on yesterday. I'm just letting you know. I don't know about you. Sir. <laughs> Did they find us? Norway's <laughs> ready for Al. <laughs> <laughs> the Al is ready for Norway. Uh, but I think a lot of the thinking that underpins that model is wellness based. And so you'll see that in, in a lot of the work we're doing here. And I think looking to them as a, as a thought leader on some of this is a good idea. Yeah, and the pay. Yeah. Because I think it's like 70000 or something like that for a corrections officer. So, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, uh, that's you know, well out of the ballpark the of where we, things yeah, are going. should be able to show us nationwide kind of where pay is at for us. Yeah. Uh, which will be helpful for us to understand. That's always been a struggle here in Vermont for folks who, <clears throat> even coming in to be in a commissioner's position or a secretary of an agency or in the judicial branch, our salaries are not comparable to what you can get in the private sector. Um, so then there could be a push in the legislature to increase salaries that then might include increasing your state budget which people say, we spend too much now, we don't need to spend all this money. So that's the tug of war. That's your push and pull that happens in the building, in the state house. And that's been going on for years and years and years. And public sector jobs in Vermont do not pay as much <coughs> as your private sector across the board. I'm not making excuses for DOC, but in all the other committees that you'll end up sitting in, there'll be that pressure for that. So I think if so we got one more question and then I want to go back to going through the handout because it may answer a lot of other questions folks have. Wayne. We've had that one and we've been talking about the pro programmatic changes and modernizing uh, how we go about the prison system. But as part of that, then the training and certification that you would be doing uh, for those people, that should provide some stepwise mechanism for improving the pay structure or the structure within uh, that without just saying everybody gets paid more. You, you, you gain skills. You, I see. Yeah. You, know, you gain different kinds of skills or certifications and you're doing different things than what you did before. Mm -hmm. And that, that can justify something that may even help with recruiting if you're, if you're more specialized. Yeah, that's a very interesting that a valid point. Absolutely. We tried to do that <clears throat> with the Justice Council, training council for training and for possible certification and decertification, but that hasn't gotten very far for a variety of reasons on both sides. Right. 
Um, so turning back to the presentation then, I just wanted to show you uh, on the front of this part of the presentation, our vacancy data looking at it longitudinally over the last several years. Um, one thing to caveat in looking at this is this is department-wide vacancy numbers. So really the most important metric again today is security staff <laughs> vacancy because those are the positions in the facilities we really need to fill. That number uh, was at about 30% over this last summer. So that while the department uh, was at 21.3, 21.5, the security staff was at 30. But you'll see, and, and this is to preview what's to come, once we implemented our plan and it started to take root, we started to see a receding of that issue. And, and I wanted to highlight, we added this slide, the next slide on overburdened field staff to highlight one of the major problems we've heard from the field is the exposure of the field to standby work and overtime. That overtime generally is reflecting when they're doing hospital coverage at uh, one of the state hospitals to monitor an incarcerated individual, a job that historically was a facilities job, but has been taken on by the field due to the staffing shortage. So what is standby? Standby is um, a status, so you're not scheduled to work. Oh, but, but you're on call. But you're on call, basically, yep. And we pay a standby rate for our staff who are on standby during that period. And through the side letter agreement with the uh, VSEA, we added additional hourly uh, rate to that to support them through the standby rate. So what really threw a monkey wrench in a lot of this, I mean, you always had some higher standby and uh, overtime pre-COVID, but when COVID kicked in, that's what really skewed. Yeah. I mean, the system... It, it was, DOC got a big hit. The system Staffing was strained. COVID. COVID broke it, mm -hmm. and now we recognize... You know, COVID isn't the impact any longer, but we'll never go back to where we were. The, the system has changed. The world has changed dramatically since then. I mean, the, the reality is you look at this orange uh, and it's increasing. Mm -hmm. Part of what that reflects is that the population we serve is a lot sicker than they were even three years ago. And so we're having significantly more hospital visits, significantly uh, higher acuity concerns with, with illness in the facilities, et cetera. That's not the only reason that's happening, but that is a contributing factor. So let's get to the plan that, that we started in the summer. And this is, this is kind of a living plan. So we keep adding to it as we go and learn more. Um, but these are the major tenets of the plan that, as it started. Um, and, and like I said, we're adding to it. The biggest complaint we heard from staff, single biggest thing, it was not about money, it was about not having enough time away from the facilities. Nobody got to see their family, nobody got to do their hobbies, nobody had recuperation time from their shift. They just were working all the time, they never got to go home. And so we set out to understand how we could impact that, knowing we have very few staffing resources. How do we get to a place where we can get people away from the facilities as much as possible? So we redesigned our schedules. We reached an agreement with the labor union to uh, implement on a temporary basis 12-hour shifts. We did that a couple of different ways. I think we can fast forward a little bit to kind of where we're at today. Four of our six facilities are on 12-hour shifts where they work 50% of the days in a pay period. So two days on, two days off, three days on, three days off. Uh, we call it the 50-50 schedule because you work half the days of the year, you get half the days off, 12 hour shifts. Two of the facilities, because they haven't reached their minimum staffing threshold to switch to that, are on 60 hour work weeks, 12 hour shifts. And we know there's actually more than that because folks are still working overtime. So I'm gonna stop you there because I think it's important for the committee to understand how you put what triggers the 50-50? Because mm -hmm. when you first started with this, it was back in August, I think it was. You were negotiating with VSCA. Yep. You had a side letter yep. that was agreed to. And that's where part of that part of that 11 million that you talked about over the past two years, part of that um, was in shift differentials, uh, increased mm -hmm. salaries, yep. benefits. 
And we worked on that, and I can't remember the exact number, but it was in uh, the general fund BAA that we worked on because it yeah. did increase and the budget. And there's some BAA this year too. In 22, the FY 2023 20, BAA, the one we're just doing. And I forgot how much that was that we gave approval to, um, but that was a result of the side letter. Correct. But I think what would be helpful for the committee is the first thing that you initiated was the 12 hour shifts before you got into the 50 50. Oh, sure. I well, think that would be important that. for the committee to understand the process so, first, because because some of the some of the uh, correspondence that members are probably still getting from some staff as we're working, you know, it's this 12 hour shift five, six days a week and we can't sustain this. And you you were very clear by instituting a 12 hour shift for some for the facilities statewide it's just to stop the bleeding for a little bit and then they transition into the 50 50 work schedule right but there was some parameters and qualifications that had to be met to get into the 50 50. so i want you to start at that 12 hour shift sure first yeah. two, two big things happened the, the the biggest things first was um, you know, we're on eight hour shifts, three shifts in a 24 hour period, kind of your traditional eight hour shift model. Um, that was what you were scheduled for. What you were actually working is 16 hours, so two of those per day. Um, and often two, two shifts back to back, eight hours off, and you're right back for another 16 tomorrow uh, because we had too few staff to run the facilities any other way. Uh, this came to a head during the Omicron phase of COVID, really January of last year, when uh, our St. Johnsbury facility, <clears throat> they lost too many staff. We, we bottomed out. We hit the number that was the man, the, what we felt was the bare minimum number of staff to run a facility. Um, and so looking at our emergency staffing plans, I mean, just as a, as a matter of math, you need fewer people to run a facility if they work 12 hour shifts in a 24 hour period than you need to run eight hour shifts. And so we flipped the schedule at St. John's Barry, emergency 12 hour shifts um, to stabilize that facility. And unexpectedly, after a few weeks, the staff started reporting that that was preferable to the structure they were under previously. And the reason for that was it provided much more stability in their schedules. They could predict when they were going to work. They could predict when they were going to have days off because it had a fairly miraculous stabilizing effect on St. John's. That was not the intention. The intention was to like get us through the next week and then we'll figure out what to do with that next week. Uh, but we pretty quickly figured out from staff that that was a much better setup for them. So that planted a seed and we started to try to understand why was that happening? What was most stabilizing about that? Why did staff prefer that over the eight hour shifts? Um, that research kind of was ongoing and, and just kind of a thought exercise. St. Johnsbury remained on the 12 hour shifts and, and we talked at one point about switching them back and, and their preference was not to switch back. That came about the same time as the second event happened and that's when Springfield also hit its minimum staffing level. That was June 22, the day the survey was taken, basically. Um, and so June 22, Springfield is at its lowest staffing level, bare minimum to run the facilities, and we switched them to the emergency 12-hour shifts also. But around that same time, we had studied 12-hour shifts and looked at different models, how you implement this, and found that if we could get staff to um, each facility to a minimum staffing level, we could switch them over to a 12 hour shift model that they would only have to work 50% of the days in a two week pay period. Uh, and there's different ways to do that. You may have heard of like a four or three schedule. So it kind of rotates back and forth, four, three, three, four. Um, we chose very specifically, we chose a two on, two off, three on, three off model because going back to this, what we heard from staff is that don't get enough time away from the facilities and I have to wait forever to get a weekend off. The 223 model enables every facility staff member to get a three day weekend over the weekend every pay period. So every other week, you have a three day weekend over the weekend. That 
uh, in and of itself is I think the best reason to have this schedule. It gives staff that requisite time at home with their families, often when their spouse or partner has time off as well, kids are not in school on the weekends, they actually get to spend time with their families. They get to do their hobbies, whatever that is. They get to go out with friends if that's what they like to do. So it was those emergency events that kind of pushed us towards this concept. Um, and then when we studied it, we found there's preferable models that we could adapt. Uh, we went to VSEA and, and negotiated out the side letter, which included mechanisms for getting us to the 12 hour shifts, but also included substantial pay increases um, and a variety of other things like the market factor analysis and, and the like. Um, so that's the brief history as to how we ended up here in the first place. Um, St. Johnsbury <coughs> had the option to go to the 50-50 schedule and actually delayed it a little bit to stay on the old schedule. I still don't quite understand why that was. Um, but they were really the kind of predicate for our understanding of how these schedules would work and, and the staff response. Um, so how many facilities right now are still on that 12 12 hour shifts, and how many have moved to the 50 50 work schedule? So, four of the six facilities are on the 50 50. Two remain on the original 12 hour shift. And what are the two? Uh, Northern in Newport and Northwest in St. Albans. And Northern, because they haven't reached the staffing level to kick in the 50 50. Right. Because you have to meet a certain those, staffing level to kick into the 50-50. I'll highlight that both of those facilities have been doing some remarkable recruiting. And hopefully their retention rate is stabilizing. Um, and so we hope we could get them there in the spring. So what feedback are you hearing from the folks that are on the ground doing this? What's the feedback that you're hearing? And is it different per facility? A little bit. I mean, so we were able to move. So we implemented this plan in early September. We were able to move uh, CRCF in South Burlington and Marble Valley in Rutland to the 50-50 immediately. Everybody else went to the 12-hour shift, 60 hours a week. Uh, the immediate reaction was a little mixed. I think it's part of kind of figuring it out. What is this like? My shift. My posts change all this, you know, there's a lot of churn that happens when we make a move like this, but pretty immediately that stabilized and recruitment started to go up. Uh, next was St. Johnsbury that came, I think about a month later. Um, and they had already been on 12 hour shifts now for 10 months and were very used to it. There was really no change in, in our reactions. Um, then I think much to our surprise, cause you'll remember in June, Springfield was in crisis. Mm -hmm they very quickly caught back up and were able to switch to the 50-50, I think in November or early December, um, and, and really had a stabilizing effect there. There were some other things we did at Springfield as well that I think helped that, that aren't included here, but um, the reaction from staff, when I rock around the units, the reaction from staff is very positive. And, and we can back that up with data now because we've started doing staff satisfaction surveys on this plan. And that was one of the predicates from the beginning is, before we even go to this, let's ask people what they want. And then let's figure out, okay, they want X, don't want X, how do we, how do we make this work? And to the tune of, we asked at every facility, what hours do you want to work? You want to work six to six, 10 to 10, 12 to 12, two to two. We let people start having a voice in the system. And I think that was appreciated as well. So before we switched anybody over, we let them vote on whether they wanted to switch. Every one of those votes that we've had, they've overwhelmingly voted to switch to the tune of 60 to 70% of the facility voting to switch every single time. Um, and so the data would suggest that this is positive. It's not without faults, don't get me wrong. And I think particularly some of our more senior staff, th this is disruptive to them. You know, Some that have had weekends for a long time, lost a weekend, et cetera. And, and I wanna respect that, understand that. Um, but we have to do what's best for the whole system to retain the staff. And, and this is one way that we can impact that. So we have a question. Okay. I'm busy typing. Tristan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, uh, regarding those staff surveys, have you talked to your uh, print research partner, UVM, about um, kind of integrated approach to long-term 
uh, monitoring of, the, of that from utilizing the really great data that they had, yeah. keeping in mind that the sort of over survey population and use different methods that can kind of pollute. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that is always a concern. <laughs> I get that. Um, we haven't yet. So they're, they're involved in the print effort with us. That's kind of their primary focus at the moment. We're catching a lot of data on this in the print surveys. That's unique to Springfield, of course. But um, I think that is an area for exploration when we get there, you know, towards the tail end of the print effort. Um, and there's been discussion of, does the print effort stop? Do we bring it in-house and continue it because it's such a valuable tool? Those types of conversations that I think, you, you know, University of Vermont, unique, strangely, in my mind, but uniquely, has some really great researchers on corrections. Um, and so we want to make sure we capture that value. And we've got the partner right down the street. So I think that's a great idea. Right now, the staff satisfaction surveys that I was talking about are being done by our internal data and research team. Um, and we just ran one, so we'll release that. I think that they're finalizing the data cleanup this week. And so hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll release that to all of our staff, as we always do, and then to everybody here as well. The goal here is just to be as open as possible. We're not trying to say this is the best thing ever. We're saying this is what the data is showing us this is working, so we're gonna keep on it. The data showed us that that other thing didn't work. We're not gonna do that anymore. And and there's no, I'm sure there are better answers, there are right answers, but we're not wedded to any one thing. We just wanna get it right. And, and so we're following the data, we're following evidence and not just the knee jerk reaction to we know this has always been a problem that we're going to throw this solution at it. We just can't afford that anymore. The problem's too big. So let's get to the data. So that's your further. Okay. Let me burn through a couple of these. We talked about the market factor analysis. That was a key component of our plan. Um, we also needed to design a more permanent systemic commitment to staff. That's the professional development. That's the staff wellness. Um, so those are the next two planks. We created the data and research unit. And we're currently working on the field stability component of this. And that's proven to be much more challenging than I expected. Uh, but we can provide updates on that in the coming, uh, coming weeks. So some of the early successes. Um, <clears throat> the first academy we ran after implementing this plan um, was late last year. It was nearly three times bigger than any academy in modern memory. Uh, so we ran 20 ish cadets through an academy on average. This this academy started with 51, well, it actually started with 60 and, and through attrition ended with 51 graduates. Uh, vast majority of them are staying in the facilities, which is great. I mean, that's that's a drop off point often as they go back to facilities, it's not exactly what they thought, decide to, to move on. <clears throat> One of the primary reasons that folks were reporting having joined the department was the introduction of the 12 hour shift model because they knew that meant work-life balance in a way that they can't get many employers, many employers to recognize. Um, we also made more efficient and optimized our facilities. There were posts that we created that just weren't valuable anymore, weren't providing uh, a necessary function. So we were able to find some efficiencies there. And then we moved, as I said, the four of six facilities over. <clears throat> so the early data, what you're seeing in this um, yeah, on the right slide here. The blue box is the number of people we're hiring. The orange box is the number of people we we're losing. And we could trend this backwards for a long time where blue and orange, orange was overwhelming blue every time. The first quarter after we implemented our plan was the first quarter that we had a net gain in a long, long time. And it was a pretty big net gain. So we have a question, Commissioner. Gina? I'm just wondering, out of the um, for this whole retention program, how many like bonuses have you paid out so far? Or people have you retained beyond the six month mark? Uh, we could pull that down for you. We so we did in the most recent side letter. There were four different types of bonuses. There was a referral bonus. So I asked you to come join. You join. I as the employee get a bonus for doing that. There was the new hire bonus, so the staggered, you get so much based on how long you stay bonus. And then there were two department-wide 
bonuses as just a general retention bonus for folks who have been in the department a certain amount of time. Um, <coughs> So that, that was all agreed to when you negotiated with right. VSEA back in August, and you had the side, side letter. Yep. And I looked up the amount in the general fund VAA that we approved of $6.8 million for this, as well as salary increases. That goes away, though, at the end of this fiscal year, doesn't it? Well, the agreement ends in March, so we'll have to go right. back to the table with our labor partners and, and decide how best to move forward on that. Um, um, and so in a month. <laughs> yeah, I know it's going quick. When is the your when is the VSCA contract up for renegotiations? I believe the renegotiations will start in October. There's fall time for August. August. Of this year? And you have what? A two year contract? Yeah. Okay. It just to lay some of the groundwork for the committee to know what's percolating ahead of us or ahead of them. So then I had mentioned before that the vacancy rate that we showed you earlier was the department-wide vacancy rate. This slide looks at just the security staff vacancy rate. Um, it's by quarter. I'll tell you the point in time high water mark for us was June of this year, and that was 30% vacancy in their security staff positions across the system. Since that time, this 25.8 this number I think was taken near the end of December. It's actually a little lower than that this morning. Um, but since that time, we've seen nearly a 5% drop in our point in time vacancy rate. And you'll see the trend line is pushing downward for the first time uh, in, in quite a while. And so we're seeing uh, a real impact on our overall security staff vacancy rate in the facilities. So then this, this next slide, it's a little complicated, but um, this, I think, really shows the impact of the 50-50 schedules. Um, the orange, I'm sorry, the blue is where we started. That's, that's basically the percentage of staff under the threshold that we set. So you remember I told you we had to hit a threshold in order to switch these uh, facilities to the 50-50 schedule. So the blue is where we started. So, 86% in South Burlington, 84% in Rutland, 86% in St. Johnsbury, 56% in Newport, 60% in St. Albans, and 71% in Springfield. The orange is what happened afterwards. So we implemented uh, the plan and, and really pushed recruitment as hard as we could. And, and pretty quickly, so this, uh, the orange represents November of 22. Pretty quickly, we were pushing every facility's staff numbers up. Um, and, and when they hit their threshold, we were able to switch them over. So uh, I think that, that pretty well indicates the positive impact that the plan was having on each facility's staff, staffing members. Um, so just to summarize this, I've got kind of two different summary slides here, but, but one is the part of the reason that we weren't positively impacting our staffing numbers is we didn't understand the root causes of what was happening. Uh, and, and we're trying to be much more thoughtful and evidence-based in how we go about this going forward. We, our, our recruitment is at the highest it's been since I started uh, across the board. We're, we ran the largest academy we have in, in modern memory. We, the, the current academy is larger than the average, uh, and this is typically the lowest uh, population academy that we run, this January academy. Um, we already have an average size academy next uh, lined up, but we still have several weeks to recruit for that academy, uh, and so we expect that one to be higher than average as well. Um, and, and we're working to get facility duties back to the facility away from the field and address some of the concerns we've heard now. Um, the key takeaways that, that I want you to walk away with are really, this is pretty cutting edge uh, nationally. A lot of folks are not looking at the problem quite the way we are yet, and, and Vermont's part of an initiative to tackle that. Uh, we've injected $11 million into the pockets of our correction staff and, and remain committed to figuring out if that's enough, if that's the right amount, or, or whether we need to do something different. And then if we're going to be successful, these, these things at the end here, that's where we're going to make the, the difference, in our opinion. And we'll test that and we'll bring that information to you and, and keep you posted. So we have some questions. Yeah. Eric and then Troy. 
you, you mentioned the academy on a couple of uh, occasions and the classes that have come through. Has there been any development or new strategies in regards to the training that's being provided to new correctional officers coming in, or is it still the same previous how an academy would run? Yeah, so the academy is interesting. So to, the short answer is yes. We have added things. We added an entire week to our academy at the end of last year, and now the academy is a week longer than it had been historically. That's to include additional training that we think is really important. Much of our academy is focused on trauma-responsive training. Uh, all of it is evidence-based. It's, it's one of the best corrections curriculum in the country, and we brought in outside groups to help us develop that. We didn't develop it all in-house. Uh, we really want our academy a national standard because, to your point earlier, that's kind of a make or break. If we train people the right way from the beginning, we're going to have better results long-term. Um, that's this, the division that manages the academy is also charged with our other staff experience work. So that's the professional development, career development work. They're currently working on designing career roadmaps and career development strategies that will be given to every employee in the system. But we started at the academy. And so now every uh, recruit that leaves the academy leaves with a career development. They're not perfect yet. This is kind of our first shot at it. Um, and we'll continue to refine that and make those better. But we thought, well, we've got a great place to start. We've got a new batch of recruits coming in. Let's get them off on the right foot. Even though we might have left some people behind in the past, we can get them up to speed, but let's let's get it right with this new group. Um, those career development plans and career roadmaps, I think, are going to be a really critical tool to helping supervisors, managers, um, and employees kind of work their way through the system. Yeah. Let's follow up quickly. Yeah. Um, in regards to the academy with the that that level of training the um implementation of some type of um development and training for case management very very that would be of, of great value if yeah, you I look at your the the staffing and from what i understand many individuals have moved into a case management position from a <clears throat> correctional officer. That's you mean case different. planning or case management for an incarcerated individual? Yeah, the, the, yeah being, a, being a case manager in the facility, so some level of development and training that gives them the tools to understand the concepts and, and so forth behind managing uh, a case development of plans, the assessments, things like that. I think there's really two parts to that problem set. One is on the training side. I think that's important. We need to do a better job of training the folks for those jobs because those are really important if we're going to achieve our policy objectives. The other part is we need better tools. Uh, our case management tools aren't the best and so that's some of the things we're going to talk to you about this year in this session is hey if we invested in these types of tools it would help us with better case management. It would help mm -hmm. officers understand um, oh this is where this person is going wrong or this would be a good path to get them on to have a more positive re-entry situation so I'm excited to dig more in on that um, and I think we need to hit both sides of that equation the, the training side and then the tools that we give our team to do the job absolutely thank you yeah. Troy and then Tristan um, I think the most alarming piece of information that I took from the print data was the suicidal ideation uh, alarming um, and I think presents, you know, with that knowledge that um, our institutions are creating that sort of suicidal ideation, there's an obligation um, to respond to that. It presents an incredible liability now that we know that is out there. Um, my understanding that Prin is taking a small break. They're concerned about survey fatigue. I think that's a valid concern. Um, I also talked, so this is anecdotal, but I, I place a higher value in qualitative data. Um, Leona, is that her name? Um, talked to her this morning. I overheard the conversation you were having with her. Um, I know that some of that um, fatigue is still incredibly present, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. I guess conjecture, but I think it's probably a pretty good one, is that that sort of fatigue leads to the suicidal ideation that was ever seen. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know um, if you're measuring for that, if you're keeping track of that, if so, how. Um, I, it's, it's a significant word mm -hmm. for me. 
Um, and then separate but equally kind of important question, um, who did you involve with the mission and vision work that you're about to on? So I'll take the suicide uh, issue first. Uh, couldn't agree with you more. Um, that is definitely the most alarming piece of the data in the print survey results. Uh, it was last year, and it is this year, and it's getting bad, getting worse. It's already bad. Um, so we stood up a suicide prevention advisory panel. I think we talked briefly about that when we talked about the print work. Um, that's staff run. Uh, there are clinical mental health professionals involved, but we really wanted that to be grassroots isn't the right word, but really kind of capturing the full suite of staff. So there's line staff, there's supervisory staff, there's facility staff, field staff um, with mental health professionals to help kind of guide that work. And one of the things they're working on right now is designing a way to study this problem. In the, in the Vermont correction system, recognizing that we need that information to be able to know if we're making an impact or not. Um, so that is really important. Um, there's even limitations to the print version because it's taken once a year, it's a point in time. We need probably a better real-time pulse on that problem set, uh, but it is something that, that we're really concerned with. I think it's the fatigue, as you mentioned, of, of the job, um, but it's also, the fatigue of outside life. And I think what I mean by that is we know that like we're human beings, we don't leave our human problems at the door when we get to work. Those come in from the outside and they leave with us when we go home from work. And I think thinking about it as just a, we gotta take this as a DOC problem um, isn't big enough. We need to, one of the things that we think about when we talk about our staff wellness work is corrections, is not just a job, it's a lifestyle. It impacts every facet of your life. So the department needs to wrap around people in every facet of their life. One, an example of this is, you know, the state has an EAP program that corrections staff just don't. What's an EAP? I'm sorry, Employee Assistance Program. Basically resources for employees. There's a lot of suspicion, understandably, of those programs, um, getting in contact with mental health counselors, all of it. Um, but what we've seen success in is if we can bring resources into the department that are validated by other corrections folks, we get much better buy-in from our staff. And so what we want to do is grab kind of the EAP offerings, bring them inside, and expand them. So that means retirement planning, because we know, you know, and financial planning, we know those are big stressors in people's lives that can contribute to uh, mental health concerns. Uh, we know that folks go through divorce or go through custody issues and need access to legal assistance, and that's something the EAP program provides. Um, we know that people are suffering, either they, they suffer from trauma they experienced in DOC, and there's a lot of it, these are very traumatic careers, or outside, as, as everybody does, and need access to mental health counseling. <laughs> Uh, emotional health support, physical health, huge component of mental health. And so how do we get all of this infused into our system so an employee tomorrow can say, I'm suffering and I need some assistance, whether it's financial help, uh, legal help, mental health, whatever, so that we can chip away at some of this to, to say like, hey, we don't want you suffering alone. The department is here with you to help you through this. And, and I don't think our staff believe that right now. And that's where we need to get. Um, the second part of your question was who we included in the mission, vision, value. So we started that work at our senior leadership team. It's currently being uh, worked on with a cross-cutting group uh, across the system. So field facilities, leadership, line, um, and that's being run out of our office of professional standards and compliance, kind of our staff experience team. Um, so it initially started at, at a central level, and now we're trying to democratize it across the system. So I want to move on here because we're in, on the floor in an hour and I want to allow time for VSCA sure. as well. So any other questions of the commissioner and then we'll move on to VSCA. John and then Eric. I want to be listening before I ask any questions. Just forgive me if I circle back a little bit. $24 an hour versus 25 the, the, the benefit package when you work for the government unless you're a legislator is substantial. <laughs> <laughs> and no, but look at all the people you, you went to work in. You really get an employee and a quarter. 
in a one benefit package. So um, even though you're paying a substantial amount of overtime, you're getting a lot of work. I'm not suggesting you stick to 60 hours a week perpetuity, but nonetheless, it, it, the bottom line probably is healthy. But the problem is, John, it's easier to deal with a bagel than dealing with people. I, I understand the twenty dollars an hour and twenty five puts food on the table and pays your mortgage. Benefits are no. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, a bagel doesn't talk back to you. A person there supervising in a correctional facility talks back at you, kicks you, throws stuff at you. Carol, let me finish. So that that's the difference. Let there. me finish. Uh, second thing, uh, question on your recruiting: whether or not you do a psychological profile, or if you just check for a pulse. And more along with that is if you bet some people with at least some level, you may have a better retention level. Yeah, so that is, that's not the psychological profile, but the raising the standard is something we've done. Okay. And we didn't bring that standard down, even though we were suffering so much, because we end up having a higher retention rate and we get better quality employees if we raise the standard and we keep it high. And so there is a higher standard than, than we had used previously. Um, and there's more that goes into the background investigations and things like that. Um, but we don't do a psychological profile. It, okay. Having experienced that. You, you touched on this a little bit, but I want to emphasize that how important it is to have a team atmosphere um, and team meetings regularly and really listen to the employees so they feel like they're part of the system. Sounds like that's the track you're heading down, and I encourage you to take it to the next level. None of this would have happened if we didn't, if I didn't personally spend time in every facility, in every field of health, going through the living units and just talking to people. I mean, that was really what guided a lot of this. We saw it in the print survey. It was confirmed when we talked to people in person through our own surveying, but we need to be able to talk about it and get information. Um, so let me just tell you, we've got a monthly town hall. That is an open Q&A. We don't take questions in advance. We let people ask them on the fly during the town hall. We record that and send it out. And we try to write it up most of those meetings so we can send it out because we know like the CO2 isn't going to get that if he's working the night shift because we do it during the day, obviously. Um, we have a dedicated channel where staff can communicate directly to me on any topic. Um, we try to send out workforce messages as frequently as we can to try to make those as informative as possible. Um, communication is something we don't do very well, uh, but we're trying and we're getting better and better. And I think we have a lot to learn. And I actually learned some really interesting things last week about how we can do this even better than we're doing it. But that's a growth area for us. We're digging in on it, but, but it's something we need to keep doing better because that then staff feel involved and hear what's going on and they know, Hey, at least they're trying. <laughs> you know, we get a lot of that. Like, I don't care what you do, just try. Try something and then show us that you're trying. That's it's huge. Don't let up. <laughs> I'm trying not to. Uh, Eric. I just had uh, one thing, Madam Chair. I believe it's important that we do uh, schedule for the commissioner return to be able to address Act Fifty Six in regards to. Oh, the the monitoring commission and yes. the investigative units. We did take some testimony oh, on that piece of legislation last week. So we would like an update. Thank you for reminding on on how that's starting to play out or where there's some growth pains yes. happening because there are some growth pains. That would be a good idea. Yeah. Okay. So before we finish up, maybe Isaac can reach out to Phil and we can maybe set up some time for that. Thank you, Eric. Keep this pretty quick, Commissioner. More of an idea, maybe. Um, I think. The, the incentives for retention, that looks like a smart thing. Um, as you said, the sort of, I think culture is really important and are these, are folks in it together? Have you looked at it sort of facility level incentives of, of some kind of say, hey, these are, our, these are our retention goals for the facility as a whole. And if we hit that together, we help each other succeed. Blank, uh, something you really want could happen. Um, we haven't looked at that per se. I mean, I think in some ways we did that with the thresholds around moving to the 50-50. That was a huge motivator for facilities to recruit. Um, but no, I mean, I think in general we haven't looked at incentives facility by facility, but I think it's, it's an interesting idea. That's a good time. And, and worth uh, digging in on. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Thank you Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we're due on the floor at 3 o'clock. I do want to give time for VSCA. Can we just continue? And if folks want to take a personal break, just take your personal break. Does that work for folks? Yeah. Okay. So is it you, Steve, that's coming up? Is yes. it Vince? It's nope. Let people move out a little bit. Cousin Vinny. Oh, cousin. Cousin Vinny. Not Uncle Vinny. It's Cousin Vinny. That's right. That was it. We haven't heard that in a while, have we, Vince? No, he reminded me of it the other day. Harry reminds me every once in a while. Those are the good old days negotiating at 2 o'clock in the morning. Over $10,000. for those off and then say, I gotcha. Hang on to Over $10,000 for a bell up in Richford. <laughs> Steve, why don't you come on up to the front here? I want to make sure we still have a quorum. We're still live, so we're going to be. Uh, all right. I see one. Good welcome, afternoon. Welcome, Steve. Thank you um, very much. And if you could identify yourself for the record. I shall. I, I am Steve okay. Howard. I'm the executive director of the BSEA. Um, and we represent the correction. We're well, actually, we're, we're the only folks who are elected by the members uh, who work on the front lines and probation and parole and in the correctional facilities to speak on behalf of the employees. So it's really important that you know that when we're expressing uh, what we're telling you, it's because the, mem the staff have actually authorized us to speak on their behalf. Uh, and really, there's nobody else who can speak on their behalf. Um, but I do want to, I have some, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach, but I wanted to start by saying, I think I've, Madam Chair, come full circle because 30 years ago, I walked into the State House and served on the Institutions Committee. <laughs> <across> <laughs> me. <laughs> and uh, now I'm um, 30 in the Ways and Means Committee room, where I spent eight out of the 12 years That's in true. the State House. Uh, and then I left the state house, and I, I never really anticipated how much time I would spend in court and then in prisons. Um, but I have been in this position for 10 years. And while I'm not going to throw a lot of numbers at you, uh, I am going to tell you that I have spent 10 years in the break rooms of those PNP offices and in the break rooms of those correctional facilities on all three shifts at all times of the hour of the day and night. I've spent time sitting with the spouses of our correctional staff and listening to what they have to say and what their, what their concerns are. And I, I have, what, the approach I've chosen to take is one that you've probably heard um, me share with you before, which is to um, share with you the feedback that I received from our members in the probation and parole offices around the state and in the facilities about the 50-50 the plan and about what the current situation is um, in the field and in their facilities. But I feel compelled to respond a little bit to what the commissioner just offered you. Um, and here I can just see our members across the state and I know a lot of them are watching today. Uh, this is, to, it, it doesn't make really much difference to characterize this as a Vermont problem or a national problem. What our members would say to you is we have a leadership problem, a leadership problem. And it starts at the top. It starts with Governor Scott, who doesn't seem to engage on this issue at all. We are, as you can see at, from the data in Southern State, at a serious crisis point. We don't even know if the governor understands this is a problem because he doesn't speak to us about it. Our members, in between these 16 hour shifts, working endlessly in hospitals. Saw Leona Watt leave because that's where she's headed. They sat down and wrote Governor Scott a note and said, hey, we'd really like to talk with you about what your, what your understanding is of this problem and what your plan is to fix it. That was in October last year. They have not received even so much as an acknowledgement that the governor has received this letter. So I would ask this committee to ask the governor to please respond to these hardworking people who took the time to write to their governor because they want to make sure he knows what the problem is. They want to make sure he has a plan, that this hasn't been kept from him. 
they trust him to come up with a solution, but they want to know that he understands what they're going through. Um, so I, I just want to share that with you because to our members saying this is not a problem we can fix is, is I whole, wholeheartedly um, misguided. If the commissioner in this administration is interested in solving the problem of how you recruit and more importantly, retain staff, the best place to go for that information is to the staff and to talk with them about what it would take to fix the problem. And, and ironically, through their collective bargaining agent, elected, elected in a two to one vote uh, just recently to represent them, they have put forward proposal after proposal after proposal on everything from compensation to a career ladder. And they have gotten zero. They have gotten almost none of that from this administration. Career ladders are critical. You hear the commissioner talk about it. So in the last, one of the last negotiations, we, we proposed a career ladder. We set up a committee to establish a CO3. The committee has not met. The committee has not met. There's not a commitment to building a career ladder. Let me just tell you, there is a commitment to make you and the public feel that there's something being done. What I'm gonna share with you from our members is a reality that shows a very different picture than what you hear from the administration. And I think Representative Morrissey hit the nail on the head. Boy, what a difference a week makes. Because last week we heard from the commissioner, but it's all fine, it's all good. We're just down to two more facilities. It's all good everywhere else. And you know what? The facts don't line up with those talking points. So we've had to change the talking points. Now we can't solve the problem. It's a national problem. It's Joe Biden's problem. It's the Congress's problem. It's not, that's not leadership. That's not leadership. The way you solve this problem is you listen to the men and women who are holding this crumbling department together. That's how you get to real solutions. And I just want to share with you some of what they shared, what they said to me. Um, and it, really, I'd like to say we had a good response and we had a lot of responses from people who have, um, significant amount of experience in corrections, some close to 30 years. You know, the commissioner's fairly new to corrections. This is his first job in corrections. So I thought it was important to bring to you the perspective of folks who've been there 20, 30 years working in, in this field, in Vermont, in the facilities and in the field. Um, so the first thing I just wanna say, and I think we've we have sort of addressed it, but I want to just make say it for the record uh, because there is a tendency, we didn't hear it today, but we certainly have heard it previously to say that um, we put together a new plan and we did a survey and we've got it all under control and you legislators don't have to worry about it. And because there's so much going on in the world and you all have a lot, I've served in your, in your office and I've been in your shoes, I know how busy you are, it's easy to hear that from the administration and to think, oh, okay, they've got it under control. I don't have to worry about it. Nothing could be further from the truth in this case. There is probably no problem that is more pervasive, dangerous, and life-threatening than the current situation in our facilities, in our field, and because of the impact on the field in your communities. I'm going to share with you what our members said about that. Now, I want to start with the field because we have spent a lot of time talking about the facilities and our probation and parole officers are, are, have done heroic work. They are exhausted just as the correctional officers are and they are frustrated because they have been promised by this administration and by this commissioner a plan to end their suffering in May of last year. We have now a plan to have a plan to have a plan. We still don't have the plan, and their suffering continues. And I just want to share with you some of the comments that they, when I asked them what I should say, they said, say to them, nothing has changed. It is still bad, and there's no plan to make it better. There has been no improvement in the circumstances for the field staff. Three years have been, we've been forced to cover hospitals and facilities 
uh, and be on standby 24 seven. It's created massive instability and a loss of personal time. Hospital coverage is the greatest single priority for the Department of Corrections, not community supervision. Hospital coverage is necessary, we drop everything. We do it. Community supervision is given zero consideration of that is a concern because one of the things that is a mission of this department, you saw it in the prim report, that our members share this vision for you, for, share this vision as well. I didn't hear the commissioner say today, public safety. Public safety. So often when you think of public safety, you think of law enforcement officers, police officers, our probation and parole officers are, have more of a, of a uh, social work, um, redemptive um, role to play in the process of supervising they do have a law enforcement component uh, to that, but when that becomes secondary, your constituents are put in jeopardy. Your constituents are put in jeopardy because there's nobody watching them. They're at the hospital. And when they're on their days off, they're sitting at home. If their kid's basketball game is an hour and 10 minutes away from that correctional facility, then they can't go to their kid's basketball game. And that's been going on for three years, three years. So that is a serious, serious problem. And one of the things that I heard from them is this has created a culture of despair. It's decimated morale. We feel mistreated, completely unheard and devalued by the management. So that's a little different than what you heard the commissioner say about the research that he just provided to you, how it was provided and how he came to be in a position to provide it. This is, this is, this is a text that I received this morning from somebody who's working currently in the department. The field cannot be a permanent emergency relief valve for the facilities. It's not fair to the communities we serve or the staff we have and or the staff who have to completely reorganize their lives at the drop of a hat. After three years with zero relief, we can see no hope. The commissioner has repeatedly touted his plans phased approach to resolve this crisis, and there has been zero change. Commissioner has also promoted a wellness committee. He formed almost a year ago. That has produced nothing but empty promises. Big concerns, there are big concerns, and you heard a little bit of a discussion here between Leona Watt, who's a senior probation officer in the Springfield office, almost 30 years of experience, about a plan um, on how standby is going to be uh, standby was going to be determined, currently determined mostly uh, on a local level. Now the central office wants to take that over. There are huge concerns about it, and you heard them debating it here. Um, she held her ground, I think, quite well, and I'm, I'm glad the commissioner was willing to listen to her. So I wanted to start with the field because sometimes they get overlooked in this crisis, and they're the folks who are in the neighborhoods, who are in the, in the communities, actually for providing an element of public safety to your commissioners. In the facilities, I want to just start with what I heard from Southern State Correctional Facility in Springfield. Almost all the line staff are working 16s all seven days because there are so many vacancies to fill. And now they have opened standby for correctional officers, which is very unpopular and ruins whatever life away from the facility we might have gained from this new schedule. By the way, this is one of the reasons why I'm not throwing numbers to you, at you and I want, want to suggest that you be cautious when that does happen. They say, in the central office, we have 77 security staff. We actually have 48. They are playing with the numbers. And that is because, I just talked to this person this morning, that is because they're not counting people who are on workers' comp, military leave, on temporary relief from duty. They are counting posts that were eliminated <laughs> because of COVID and because of uh, the staffing shortage. And you see that pop up in some of the numbers that the commissioner had for you today. Our members are very uh, suspect of the numbers that, that central office puts out, and that's because when they're told that there's 77 staff and they know there's only 48, it raises concerns that you're not getting accurate information. If staffing has been solved, why are caseworkers in Southern State being used to run shifts on weekends and holidays? Why is the superintendent sitting in, the, in a perimeter vehicle while the, while the chief of security is running a unit? 
five, five eight hour shifts actually provide more security staff on site at one time. With 12s, we can rarely fill the middle four. You're gonna hear that repeated throughout the state at all the, at all the facilities, which is why we have this new standby proposal. With eights, that wasn't a problem. What is the middle four? So the middle four, so you can't order somebody to work more, you have two shifts now. So you can't order somebody to work, work more than 16 hours. Oh. Right, so you have that middle four hours. People are ordered over, or they or they are called in early to cover that those four hours that are in between, in between the uh, what used to be three shifts. So, so the this fifty fifty thing includes. Uh, oh, and we're going to pull you in for four hours yeah. here. Yeah, and what they're saying is, in Southern State, where you heard the commissioner say today and last week here and over in the Senate that this is it's all there. It's just Northern and it's just St. Albans. They're working 16 hours, seven days a week, and they have the superintendent doing the perimeter security, and they have the chief of security running a unit. That's not solved. So they're being directed by their supervisors to do so, or are they choosing to cover those extra shifts? There's there there's no the reason that they're doing the question that they that they're asking is why are they doing it when that role has always been fulfilled by a, by a correctional officer. Okay. So there, it's it's because there are there are no correctional officers there to do it. Yeah, I just wanted to decipher that if if is, is somebody given a choice to say hey you want to cover an extra sixteen hour shift or is it is it such dire right now that it's really being directed. To cover more than what's being being expressed I'm, by the commission. Can't, I can't answer it specifically because I, you know, I, the superintendent doesn't work for me. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say that um, in, in the in the sort of under the auspices of listening to the frontline workers and what matters to them, and I think that when you asked Representative Morrissey this question at the height of this crisis, whether it's hospital coverage for folks who hadn't had a day off, haven't had a day off in three years and who have to do this hospital coverage and then go do their job as probation and parole officers, or whether it's somebody working 16 hour shift after 16 hour shift, when there are managers, and the commissioner has been willing to identify five to seven who were trained to work in a facility, trained to work in the field, who were, did work in a facility, who do have worked in the field, when he has identified them and when the union members asked him to assign them to the most urgent hotspots, out of central office, he refused. He absolutely refused, called it a stupid idea and refused, and refused to do it. That is demoralizing. And I said to him, look, it would actually free some of these people up, but the idea that we're all in this together and some evidence of that would have a profound effect across the system. So that is uh, an example of one small way in which you could you could listen to what the mem what what frontline workers are proposing when they're at the bargaining table, when they're in the legislature, or when they come to you in labor management and say, "How about some of these managers come help us in this crisis?" There can't be anything in central office that is more important than making sure that when an offender is in a hospital, that there's somebody there to watch them who's not exhausted. There can't be anything more important. That's the fundamental role, and I think Representative Morrissey had hit the nail on the head when she said leadership is by example. I learned early on in many, um, from many folks who are great, I consider great leaders, that there's two tests of leadership. Do you show up and do you do something? And in this case, they're not showing up and they're not doing anything. By the way, why is the commissioner not here listening to this testimony? Mm -hmm. okay. That's a good yeah. question. Okay, <laughs> I noticed that too. We're having a hard time. You got out pretty uh, quick, yeah. Having a really hard time. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah. We, we are, as the commissioner said, his labor partners. But to get basic information on the market factor adjustment he discussed, on any, on the discussion we're about to have on an agreement that's going to expire in March, pretty important idea. It is impossible to even get basic information from this administration. We have just filed grievances for the first time in a long time just to get basic information. And what we see is the commissioner is willing to communicate directly over the collective bargaining agent to our members to try to cut us out. So it's like 
there's an attempt to just pretend that the VSEA doesn't exist. I can say we've been here for quite some time. It's not going to be a successful strategy, but it is the, the way in which it's being approached from just basic information that we need to prepare for bargaining to know what's what, what's happening with the market factor adjustment that, that was agreed to, to just understanding what the workers are really saying. If you just block it out, you can pretend it's going away. So we have some. I'd rather talk to the executives across the country. <laughs> <laughs> so we do we have another question here, Wayne. A couple. Um, so they're working sixteen hours on eight hours off. Uh, they're supposed to, yes. And then back on six, eight off, back on sixteen, eight off, back yeah, on sixteen. It's supposed to be an eight-hour turnaround. Uh, with uh, the indefinitely in that sequence. Mm -hmm. So how's the middle four coming? So the middle four comes in. Previously, there were three shifts of eight, okay. yep. and now there are there are supposed to be two shifts of twelve, but you have a gap in between those shifts of four hours. So what happens is to cover that gap, people are either ordered over or they're ordered in. So that everybody's not working sixteen hours straight all the time. Not it's everybody, but 12, 12 hours with four being yeah, that's right. That's right. Can you maybe put it on the on the. 24 hour clock, it's a little confusing. I'm sorry. Can you maybe put this on a 24 hour clock for us? It's a little confusing. It's well, it is different and it was funny to hear because uh, the commissioner said, well, we took a vote. Well, that was a proposal that the VSEA made that was accepted by the administration, <laughs> what the shifts should be. Uh, it wasn't the administration's idea, um, but they did vote uh, either to have shifts of two to two or six to six. And so you have different yeah. Time frames in different facilities. So that four hours, probably two a.m. to six a.m. Uh, Ten to two, I think, is the biggest problem. At night, or yeah, ten to two at night, or ten to two. In... It's gotta be at night. Won't be during the day, would it? I think it's ten to two in the evening on the two a.m. Yeah, or the two a.m. Uh, we talked about those supervisory staff. We might be asked. So are there any, are they union, are, are the upper echelon union employees also? Supervisors are union members. So at what point do you have split, what staff that are there that are not, that are? Superintendent. Um, case workers? Are you, case case workers, workers are union, union. So they're in the bargaining unit. Shift supervisors are yeah, union. They're union. COs so, are. So then, then the next question is, I admit that. given, given that there's often Job okay. What issues might you have with having a person take a job, you know, take, perform a job that's outside of his, his or her um, job description, position yeah. description? Because that yeah. is a union issue. It's definitely an issue. Um, we're in such a, de a desperate situation. You're and ignoring that. And, and it, it is a uh, it is on the list of things that we have concerns about, but right now we are in a position where um, the health and safety of our members is in jeopardy. The health and safety of our communities is in jeopardy, and that has to be the first priority. One of our frustrations is that our members see this as a crisis, but they don't see the leadership of the administration. And I don't mean just the commissioner, because, you know, Every administration has its own um, system for how they do things, but our members want to hear from the governor. Yeah. Does term the term for that is working out of class, right? Maybe working out of classification system, yeah. working out of class. Right. If if they're covering those things. Um, so uh, I just want to also uh, share some basic uh, some I want some perspectives from the other facilities that uh, did take the time to weigh in. Um, again, Northwest up in St. Albans, you're gonna hear a continuing pattern. Uh, this, they say we have 59 security staff, we have 40. So again, you're gonna hear numbers from the administration and our members on the ground are telling you that the numbers on the, what they see on their schedule is different than what's being reported. Um, that's a problem. Uh, I mean, I, this really, is an important point to, to make as well, um, because I think you heard the commissioner say this, and we do agree with him on this. It's not just a recruitment issue. 
It is a retention issue. Um, and the people who will tell you what the reason, the reason that they stay and the reason that they, they go and who have that data are the, are the staff. So when the staff comes to you, when your frontline workers come to you and propose a side letter and propose in bargaining or come to the legislature and talk about, you know, policy issues that are outside of collective bargaining, when you don't embrace what they're telling you, uh, you don't solve the problem. And then you throw up your hands and say it can't be solved. So um, one of the things that they said here is uh, people are leaving because they can make the same amount of money elsewhere. <laughs> Representative Casey did. Um, we may have reduced vacancies by 5%, but we don't see it here in Northwest. We can hire everybody, but keeping them is another thing. And I will say to you that we, you saw, I think, in the letter that I wrote to you last week, the commissioner said here and said, the other body uh, that money isn't he said it today money's not a solution money's not the only answer money's maybe even not as important i'll tell you our members disagree with that uh, it isn't the only issue you've heard me say repeatedly and some of the new folks here haven't heard me say it maybe as much but um the divide that the commissioner referred to between the central office and the folks in the field is pronounced because they don't, they don't, as they will say to us, what our members will say to us is they don't know what those folks do in central other than send out policies that don't seem to make any sense. And in the PRIM report, you'll see that they are not consulted when those policies are developed. And so often they make no sense for either the field or the facilities. So it is, it is money is an important and critical issue. We have to increase um, the amount of money that we are providing. And I will say $11 million sounds like a lot of money. But I believe it was the state of, uh, I want to say Nebraska, maybe Tom will correct me if I get this wrong, a few other states across the state, retention bonuses, $15,000 a year, $10,000 a year. We have nothing like that in anything that has been approved by the legislature or uh, negotiated or would even be considered by this administration. So we are way off the amount of investment that needs to be made in convincing people to keep this job, because it is a difficult job. It's more difficult than, than making bagels, although I've had mornings when I thought the bagel was talking to me. <laughs> uh, and I made it through the morning, but um, it is a job that our members consider to be a job in which they are um, trained, well-trained, they consider themselves to be professionals and they believe they ought to be uh, not only respected for the, their, their, uh, their knowledge and their experience, but they ought to be well compensated for it. And I think Vermont needs to take, take a really serious look at that. Retirement is another big issue. We have a retirement proposal. It won't be, you won't be shocked to hear that. Um, that would, um, take the foundation of the new retirement plan passed last year and make it what would be a robust retention um, tool with 20 years in, 20 years in service, and then you can retire. So if you want to start at 18, you could get a full retirement at 38. And you know what? We would save money doing it because we would, and we would stabilize the corrections system. I don't care how many weeks you have the academy. You could have it for 20 weeks if you want. Our members will tell you that to learn to be a probation and parole officer or to learn to be a correctional officer, you have to be a corrections officer. And a big problem that we have, and it's expressed by some of our members here, is that a large percentage, at one point it was 50% of our CO1s had less than five years of experience. So they haven't seen suicide attempts. They haven't seen fights. A lot of folks were hired during COVID when a lot of the facilities were in lockdown. They don't know what it's like to be in the child line. They haven't staffed the MAT line when it's, you know, they just haven't had that experience. So there's no way to learn that at the academy in a way that you retain it. And so the more experience we can have with our staff, the better outcomes we're going to have. I do believe that with a strong commitment to criminal justice reform, to rehabilitation, we're not going to get that. If we don't have anybody in the community working with our with the offenders or in the community, and there's obviously a real and a desire to push people into the community and try to increase the population there, but if we if we have correction, if we have community 
are folks who are probation and parole at the hospital or standing by covering a, a facility, they're not going to be able to do that. And in the facility, if our caseworkers are covering a post and our correctional officers on their 16th hour are trying just to maintain order, the goals that the state has around criminal justice reform will never be achieved. This mission that the commissioner keeps talking about will never be anything else other than what you see on paper because it is that, that um, problematic. It's going to require a significant investment. And if you're gonna make an investment in corrections, I mean, it's really important to work, think about the buildings and the air conditioning is one is an issue that I know this committee has heard about but it's if the best investment is in the people. Um, and that's where we have to see an administration more willing to meet, uh, meet that standard. Um, so I just want to point out, the commissioner talks a lot about St. Johnsbury. Uh, and these, I, I got some feedback from the folks in St. Johnsbury. Um, and you hear a lot about the largest class ever in the academy, which we really were very happy to hear about, 51 people. It sounds great. So in St. Johnsbury, out of that huge academy class, we sent 10 people, we have two left from that class. One of those 10 people um, was pregnant and hasn't worked a single shift yet, which is not able to. So they, they that whole um, benefit is gone and you'll see the same thing reported from a very senior uh, member who works in the women's facility that they basically have lost everybody who came. Um, and so now we are back to where we started from. We have, we're, we've, we're, we're treading, we're back. We haven't lost ground, but we're not getting the gains that, that we that so, we need. Steve, I just want some clarification. When you're talking about that, is that the last group that went through the 51 graduated? And you're saying how many have been retained at the 51? So at St. Johnsbury, which is held up as the, as the shining star of, of the facility that just did so well under this new plan, um, they have lost. Uh, eight of the people who um, who uh, came out of that out of that academy, they have two left. So did they? Lose? One hasn't even worked because she's pregnant. One hasn't worked. But did they lose them to to another job in the private sector? Or did they lose them to something else within DOC? Uh, I don't know. They're just not doing security work in that facility any longer. Okay. So I will also. And, and what about the other facilities for that fifty-one that graduated? Mostly that's, um, well, you know what would be bad? I could go through this. I think it's pretty much a pattern throughout. I would say there's a little bit of an exception where I think the academy has had a positive effect to some extent, and that's at the Newport facility. There's a bigger problem at the Newport facility, which is a, um, a lack of confidence in the leadership there. And in fact, you're going to hear it pretty soon in the news that an overwhelming number, I think all but two of our security staff there, signed a letter of no confidence in the superintendent that was appointed there. And they are calling on the commissioner to put that superintendent out on leave. Um, rightfully, he has agreed to a, an investigation of uh, their concerns, which are really, really related to the safety of the facility and her ability to manage that facility. But here's one thing that happened yesterday, in the middle of all the things that were going on yesterday here in the State House. The commissioner chose to take a letter that was sent to him, was signed by almost all the staff in the facility, and really send it with, with, with a concern about retali the retaliatory environment in that facility, and then send that letter out to everybody in the facility. They were mortified. Mortified. But that is the environment we're working in now. We like the commissioner. We're having a hard time. Uh, and we've never seen something like that. Can you repeat that? I just yeah, yeah, I didn't follow that. understand that story. So uh, our members at this facility in Newport, which has had some benefit of the, they've had 10 new folks come out of the academy. And that has relieved some of the crisis, real crisis staffing, um, have sent to the commissioner and to the governor a letter of no confidence in which all but two of our security staff signed the letter saying that this, they believe the superintendent is not up to the job and that it's having serious impacts on our on the safety of this facility 
and they are asking the commissioner to do something. Now, the commissioner, to his credit. Can I clarify just quick? Is this letter of no confidence like that, is that a union action in any way, or is that just something they wrote as a, as a team? Uh, they organized it. They self-organized it, stuck their neck out, self-organized it, and they, um, once they had it done, asked us for guidance, uh, asked the, the union for guidance as to what to do next. There's not something in collective bargaining on this. No, no. Thank you. Go, but the, the, the thing that's very concerning is, um, is that that letter was then provided to everybody. What do you mean by everybody? It was sent back out to the entire facility. So everybody could see who signed the letter. Which so it was sent out to the folks beyond the officers who signed it. It was sent to the caseworkers. It was sent to shift supervisors. And, and, and to managers. And to managers so within in an the environment, facility. Within the right, facility. Within the facility. So in an environment where your concern is retaliation, you then send out the letter with all of the signatures of people who are saying you're not up to the job, and one of the problems is you're retaliatory. You now have the list of everybody so who just said that. Comment with that, or in what context did this just... No, we never. We haven't really seen something like this before. But so, so just the letter. It was just. A, I mean, just pay me a scene. Is this email? Is this a, a photocopy? It shows up in everyone's. The email sorry, is there a note? Out to everybody. And is there anything on it saying? Yes, there's a letter saying that that, that he's going to investigate this. Uh, what we're adding, what we're what we're asking him to do is to do what he would do if it if the allegations were being made against one of our members, which is to put the put the member would immediately be put on temporary relief from duty, put this superintendent on temporary relief from duty while this investigation occurs, especially since this retaliatory uh, environment exists. And now the management has a list of everybody who raised, stuck their neck out and raised a concern. So when did the letter get sent to the commissioner from the men, from? A week ago. A week ago. And when was the letter sent out to all the folks within that facility. yesterday yesterday and was there any explanation as to follow up the doc is going to be doing I believe the commissioner has said he's going to go to the facility i believe he's going there tomorrow he from is. what i've heard right i don't think that's what the members have sent a letter requested but but, it, but it's great that he's going there it's great that he's doing the investigation we do hope that uh the, the that he will consider treating the management the same way he would treat a frontline worker and put the, put the manager on temporary relief from duty while the investigation exists. I, I raised the issue to make you aware of it, but to also uh, point out that the environment in that facility um, is maybe uh, a little bit less um, onerous because of the, of the additional 10 people that came from that large class, but is um, now facing, now um, really at one of its worst points because of the manager that has been put in place. So so that's where we are with, with that facility. So Steve, I think we had a question before. Did Michelle? Um, I was just gonna make a comment um, when you were, you were asking Alice about um, how many of the new workers that had gone in remained, that it was related to that. And um, I was at a, um, an event yesterday with members of BSEA that were sharing stories of concerns. The, the, the event yesterday was about safety and security. And I happened to be sitting next to a gentleman who works at Springfield. And um, I actually asked him about this issue. I said like, oh, aren't things getting better from, there was the biggest class ever. And he said, well, he said, actually, we got a whole bunch of people at Springfield. And then he told me how many people had come in and how many people had quit in that same time. And it wasn't the same people. The new people were mostly still there but I believe it ended up being like a net gain of three, even though there had been like 10 or 12 came in, mm -hmm. but then eight or nine had quit. So um, it wasn't exactly the same situation as he was talking about it at, um, at St. Johnsbury, but certainly still a concern in that the number of new people is not keeping up with the number of people that are leaving. And I would just encourage everybody actually, if, if it's possible to attend any of those sessions, you get to hear frontline from many different people that are having direct experiences um, in a whole variety of facilities around the state, it's really valuable uh, to, to attend those, to learn more mm -hmm. directly from the workers. Mm -hmm. Wayne? Having been involved in management for quite a long time, these kinds of issues, now this disturbs me that there's a, uh, 
discrepancy, numbers discrepancy, operational kind of levels, whether it's staff of the nominal versus the actual um, on hand. And, but at the same time, I also know, having dealt with staff for a long time, they're not always privy to everything that the management level people are privy to. So they may have some misperceptions. It'd be nice to rectify those so we knew which what was what. Absolutely. I think that's a valid point. I think it's hard to hide from our members what they see on the schedule. Yeah, but it may be deeper than the schedule. Well, they see what the they see what's they see what's being counted on the schedule, uh -huh. and what who's really there and who's not. But nonetheless, regardless, even if these numbers are exactly correct mm. or not, if they're not correct, then there's a moral issue of significant proportions that they're not they don't are not aware of what's going on. They're not aware of how yeah. things are working. Absolutely, it's, and so. That's a problem. Yeah. Even if even if we're hearing the truth from one side and the perception from the other side, e either way is a problem. Absolutely. And you know, the, our members, I said earlier, our members have watched these hearings. One of the blessings of COVID is that they can watch watch this in real time and they hear what their um, managers say here in the state house. And then they compare it to what their experience is. And it is demoralizing to think that. Uh, the commissioner um, is saying things uh, or that the management is saying things that don't reflect their actual experience. And that makes them believe that there is no hope, as you heard from our folks in the field, because they don't think the management actually knows what's happening. And if you don't know what's happening, you can't solve the real problem. Uh, so that's that's just really, I think, an important thing. There, that's a really important thing to point out. And just on the numbers front, um, at the St. Johnsbury facility, Madam Chair, you asked, you, you raised this, you know, the agreement did have certain staffing targets that had to be hit before you went to the 223 schedule. Um, and in St. Johnsbury, they're going to be bidding uh, on both a five and two schedule, so 12 hours, two days off, you know, five twelves and two days off. And then the 50 50 schedule that the commissioner proposed, you know, but on both, uh, the under the agreement, they're supposed to have 66 staff. They have 53. So they don't have, even though he says they're under that, they're under that plan, they don't have the requisite staff at that facility to actually meet the target that's in the agreement. Um, so that's why I'm just really concerned about numbers and how what the story numbers could tell and what they what they also might hide um, based on what our members' real experience. Um, might be and you know and, and I was talking about Northern while we were talking about Northern and Newport they did say that the 10 folks from the Academy have helped but they have a serious concern about the number of untrained staff who are who are working untrained security staff uh, who are working checking in contractors visitors and members of the public and it's a very big concern because what you hear from our members is that contraband is introduced um, mostly when visitors come uh, and you need a lot of security on those days. And if you have folks who are providing, who are providing that security, who have not been trained, that's that's a very serious issue. And and they, it's one that they did um, raise. And they raised the that their desire is to return to eight-hour shifts, um, and that um, potentially uh, a couple of combinations of those. We've heard that from a couple of facilities that the goal is to get back to eight hour shifts, uh, which doesn't seem to be really what the, the management is saying, but they are um, they are expressing uh, that desire. And, and, and while we're at Northern State, one of the things that they also said is um, you'll hear it in the women's facility too. Our folks are being called in on their days off to do training. Right, and in some places, because of the schedule, they're not doing the training. They're not doing the core competency training. What is that core competency training? Non-lethal use of force, first aid and CPR, suicide prevention, emergency prep, fire safety. And in many of these facilities, because of the lack of security staff, are the, the offenders are not getting recreation time. That creates a very difficult environment to, to work in. Um, so. I wanted to raise this, these concerns with you, and I wanted to have them come right from the workers. 
who are working today and wanted me to share this um, because uh, these problems, the situation that we have been under is not a problem that has been solved and it's not something that you can look at as uh, a, an item to check off the checklist. We're in the middle of this, we're at the height of this. And uh, we are um, uh, really asking the legislature to devote a significant amount of oversight authority uh, and time and energy uh, to try to resolve um, a crisis that has been growing for nearly five or six years. Uh, BSEA started to testify on the staffing crisis. There was a point when I started this job uh, when Dave Bellini, everybody may have met Dave Bellini, was there yesterday, um, was our unit chair and hadn't yet been president. And he'd call me and say, there's too many temporary employees who are trying to get jobs here in corrections and we have too many people. Boy, have we come full circle from those days. Um, so uh, that is now not a problem. Um, so Steve, we do have some questions. Okay, this is a good spot to kind of intervene. The other thing too, for those survey questions that you started off, some members would do, can you submit that to us? When Which survey? The responses that you were giving at the yeah, very beginning from correctional. Yeah, from I, was, I was literally writing them down as I was coming into the driveway here today. So I I will definitely get that. And you. the time frame that they responded, was that within the past couple of weeks? Was it over the summer, hours. last 24 hours? Yeah. yeah that's great. Mary, you had your hand up. Connor, Troy, Tristan. Actually, it was kind of said because I was going to comment that when there was not enough staff, the residents of the prison do not get their, you know, what they're supposed to have. They were always talking Absolutely. about what we're supposed to be providing. So they aren't. We've even heard of the challenges with the MAP programs, the MAT, and all of that. So it has a trick of ne very negative down effect. It is, you know, it's just not a good thing. And as I said, I'm so frustrated because I've heard this now for how many years? And we keep getting better and we're not. And, you know, shame on the commissioner. I'm not saying this. I'd say it to him right to his face. For him to say we have 51 new people come out of the class and now we're hearing the end result. We don't have the numbers. I mean, that's testimony that, I mean, I'm not going to probably in the near future until he, do, until he sets the tone and the reality of what his testimony is. Not probably going to trust much of what he says. And I'm sorry to say. O'Connor and <laughs> Troy and Tristan. So like uh, full disclosure, I worked at VSEA for eight years. Steve actually took my job. Um, <laughs> and you can call my phone number. <laughs> it's his phone number. <laughs> but I, uh, you know. I, I got to know his mother-in-law really well. <laughs> <laughs> it's an appropriate text. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you have to have a talk to her. Yeah, sure. Come on, Connor. <laughs> she got back together with me after. <laughs> Took some doing. Uh, but, uh, no, it, 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 it. So what's your question? So, <laughs> I was going to get very serious now, but like, it's great. Uh, no, uh, honestly, though, I conducted probably like 100 climate surveys in my time at VSEA. And as I'm looking at that, like Springfield report, I've never seen anything like that. Like. Uh, like Troy saying, a third of the staff actively has suicidal thoughts. Yeah. It's like it's reached like almost such a level of despair yeah. that you actually like you sort of lose the motivation to even advocate for yourselves. I've seen this happen at work sites. Mm -hmm. um, so like, want to be like solutions oriented, and I'll be honest, like this is kind of overwhelming even this discussion. Um, so not, not to put you on the spot too much, Steve, but like you're commissioner for a day, like. Yeah. What do you do like right now to start turning this tide? Um, I would say a few things. First of all, you pour money in to stabilize the situation. Somebody just said, uh, one of our members said, is the administration is bragging about having first class tickets on the Titanic. The first thing you have to do is recruit and retain staff. And that means not uh, looking at what the VSEA proposes and looking at what some of the other states have provided and be the most generous state in the country um, in order to stabilize it 
to stabilize it and to try to get some control over it. Then I'm going to say what you've heard me say before. Um, I do think we have to look at the central office. Who are the managers in the central office and what is their function? You've heard me talk about, and I'll just use it politely because I know you've been in the facilities, you know that's not as clean, clean as this, but they call it screw up, move up. Um, so you can imagine what it really is. And they are tired of seeing people who make managers, who make giant mistakes, and who know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody and who end up in the central office. And the biggest example of that, which was a huge morale problem, is what happened in the, in the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility when a trained steward of the VSEA brought allegations forward to a assistant superintendent and a superintendent, and they were, they were just ignored. What happened out of that that there was a giant focus, including Downs Rackland, on our members, the people who reported this, not the two managers who ignored it. And if you ask where those managers are, central office. And that's why there is no confidence on the front lines in the central office. So I would, I would review who's in those managerial positions. I would review whether it's working. Uh, I would look at the screw up, move up, and and fix some of those problems. Um, because you have to send a message. And I would say to the managers, especially those who are already trained, guess what? We're all going to get trained. And since we're asking frontline staff without training to perform security duties, those of you who have been trained at the taxpayer's expense, expect to find yourself in a hospital bed at Dartmouth or at the Southern State Correctional Facility showing up and doing something so that our members see that it's not just us and it's that all of us means all of us not just some of us uh, so it's i think that is a you, you, you don't i don't think you can underestimate the value of that uh from a um, morale perspective that they don't think they're better than us those managers up there call it the Emerald City. They're willing to come here and help us in a crisis. Maybe so I can go to my kid's basketball game. Maybe so my spouse doesn't divorce me tomorrow. Whatever it is. Maybe I'm having a difficult time mentally with a mental health moment. Um, and I'll say, I'll tell you this, having sat in those break rooms, I have been, and I've been, I, I just remember this like it was yesterday. It was Springfield. It was like two in the morning. This, a giant tough guy of a corrections officer came and sat with me in the break room. And he, he I introduced myself, I'm Steve Howard, I'm from your union. And he just looked up and started crying. And I cry all the time. <laughs> so I was about to start crying. And he said, my wife is going to leave me. I need to pay the mortgage. I can't lose this job, but I'm gonna lose my wife. So, that is a, when you, when you get, it happened to be in Springfield, so I'm not, I guess I wasn't surprised by the results of the print, uh, the data in print, because it happened, it's happened consistently throughout this uh, system. We've pushed these people to the point of um, real destruction. And it's not just destroying them, it's destroying their families. It's destroying their spouses. Nobody who works for the state of Vermont should be destroyed by what they do. And when they are, the governor should act. The governor should act. We can't even get a response to a letter, from them, much less a meeting with these people. It, it, it's, I'm gonna tell you they're frustrated because with all, due, with all due respect to the legislature, and I've been a legislator, and I know it's tough, and you guys have been really some of the best advocates and folks who have paid attention, but our members are also really fed up with coming to the legislature and telling them what's happening and not seeing any, any real change. They're tired. It's not just, let, not just the legislature. I would say talking to the public or talking to the politicians and not seeing any change, and then going to the bargaining table and not seeing any real reflection of what is needed, the magnitude of investment that is needed to prop these folks up and to give them 
the supports they need and to get more people into the system to stabilize the system. So I'd stabilize it and then I'd invest in it and stabilize it, then I would reform it. That's how, that's that's exactly what I would do. So we gotta finish this up. We only got a few more minutes and I wanna have time for that's quick. I just Troy uh, and Tristan request uh, can you get us a copy of that October letter that was sent to the government? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Tristan? Uh, Steve, your testimony is just really evident the, what you're carrying on your back from your people and appreciate you bringing that directly to us. And I, I, at the same time, acknowledging as you just said, there's some fatigue with bringing that to us. Uh, so I uh, appreciate you extending that. The one thing that was not mentioned here, and I've heard it from a number of the employees, is that they are, I don't want to necessarily say the word threatened, but that they should not come forward to their legislators or other people to complain about what's going on. But they'll be retaliated against. Yeah. For the same thing, I've heard the same thing on the, on the ground level with the frustrations of the inability to be able to make an informed decision based on the information that they have at the time. Instead, those informed decisions will be, you know, brought against or whatever the case may be. And it does. Right now, it is causing significant problems within the community at ground level. I don't, you know, I, I, I just wouldn't mind a straight answer. A straight answer goes a long way. And I believe the, the, the members of the union would be just as appreciative of a straight answer. Absolutely. And, you know, our members are, want to be part of the solution. They're looking for a partner to, uh, to uh, find that. And the mechanism through which that um, partnership can be built is through the collective bargaining process and through the labor management process and uh, through um, the uh, union that these members had built. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we need, a, we need a, a dance partner who wants to dance with us. And right now we feel a little bit like uh, we're being shunned. Um, Steve, I remember last year you were asking about asking the governor to go and visit one of the, the sites. Um, I'm wondering if that ever happened. No. Okay. I'm going to tell you that um, it's, it, it comes up. And for some reason, it happened. I, I don't know. I'm just going to say this, but we, I get these articles all the time. But there are governors all across the country. Uh, the governor of Kansas, uh, Laura Kelly, and the governor of Alabama, Kay Ivey. For some reason, it's, it's the women who are who are the leaders of their states, who went to their correctional facilities. And we made this suggestion. The governor go to those correctional facilities, go to those probation and parole offices, and just say thank you. How hard is that? How hard, a, lot of these, a lot of our members, you, when they're not at work, which is very rare, you'll find them at Thunder Road watching the governor race. They're fans of, of Thunder Road. They'll go watch, they'll go watch that. So they look up to that. They look up and say, hey, the governor, you know, is he going to respond to our letter? No. Is he going to come? Does he know what's happened? They're not sure. I guess that's why he gets booed so much now. After yeah. Their, uh, I mean, it's, well, it's, I'll, it's, I'll write him a letter. I'm just going to there, but he, he, should, he should show up. Well, I appreciate that. And I would ask the committee to consider sending the governor a letter. Anybody wants to sign on. Yeah. And asking him to do so, this. Start words. So yeah. we, have another, we have another question here. I, I, my, uh, building on Connor's crystal ball uh, question, uh, it's, it is puzzling to me. You know, some of the comments you've made do describe just a lack of will, a lack of want on the part of the commissioner or the governor to engage, and it's puzzling. Um, you can imagine money, you know, there's limits on what the taxpayers can afford, and they might have concerns about that. But the want, the, the desire, that's puzzling. Do you have just any any insight, any theory of change here? I think change comes um, when um, when when um, uh, a demand is made. I think change comes when pressure is applied, and that can be from the public or representatives of the public, like the folks here in this room. 
And I also think it comes when you appeal to someone's conscience and their heart, which is, I mean, no one is saying the governor's a bad guy. No one's saying the commissioner's a bad guy. I like both of them. I think they have the right intentions. Um, the, the members of the VSEA are not your enemy. They are potentially your partner. But you have to partnership, you have to build that partnership and build that relationship. When they come to the bargaining table, you've got to be really open to doing more than you've been willing to do. One thing I will say on that front, and this was a little bit of a heartbreaking meeting to be in, I mean, you're in a lot of those, whether it's DCF or corrections or wherever we are. Um, you know, the, there was a huge effort um, when there were some issues in Burlington and state police got dispatched to Burlington because there was a shortage of police in Burlington. And I got a ton of emails and text messages from corrections officers and probation and parole officers who said, what about us? Why aren't they sending anybody to help us? And this one <laughs> unfortunate answer, I'll just end on this note from one of the um, correctional officers was, it's because we're behind walls and we're invisible. We're invisible. Hard break. So I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And I ask you for your help. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. So we're done, I believe, for the day. I think it's going to be a long floor um, because we've got a budget adjustment out there. Tomorrow's Friday, and um, we'll be back after the floor tomorrow. So let's go off of you.